Hi, I'm Johan Ranney, and this is MFM Conference in Hollywood, California, 2023. We just came uh, from a great session uh, with Hulan Loki, and the, the session was value and due diligence uh, considerations for music, sports, and filmed assets. And I've got Brian Marwer here, the director. I got Conrad Colosa, uh, the vice president, and I got Eva Lee, senior vice president, all with Houlihan Loki. So the session, like I said, was fantastic. Let's uh, talk about some of the highlights of it. Brian, Brian talked about valuation techniques, considerations for sports teams. Uh, Brian, what are some of the big deals that have happened recently? What are the, the thinking of how you value a sports team, whether it's NFL, baseball, or NBA? Yeah, Joe, thank you, and thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, there have been uh, a few deals recently, um, and, and we think of sports assets, of scarce assets, maybe even trophy assets to some degree. And they don't trade very often, at least changing hands from a controlling ownership perspective. Um, we've seen over the last 10 years, maybe six deals between among each of the leagues separately of control chain, control change transactions. Uh, the recent ones, one recently announced was the Washington Commanders, uh, not approved yet by the NFL, but uh, the largest, uh, I think, U.S. valuation of a sports franchise ever at roughly $6 billion. Earlier this year, the Phoenix Suns uh, transacted at a valuation of $4 billion. Uh, last year, the Denver Broncos sold at $4.6 billion. So those were the, the last three large deals. Um, the multiples that we've seen when we value sports teams, we're typically looking at a revenue multiple. So that means transaction price divided by revenue of that subject asset or the team. And we've definitely have seen those multiples move up, uh, where historically we've seen those multiples kind of in the range of five to seven times. Now, given these recent deals, we're seeing them more nine times plus. We think a lot of that is driven by the media rights increases, where the NFL has a media rights reset this year, about 160% of their prior media rights deal. Uh, the NBA will have a media rights reset coming due in 2025. It estimates that that'll be um, 180% of the previous. So we're seeing definitely continued increases in media rights, which is driving value. We also think additional value or additional growth opportunities are probably around legalized sports betting and the leagues being able to capitalize on that with new revenue streams, whether it's advertising, sponsorship, um, or other ancillary revenues. So it's it's been relatively active over the last year in NFL and NBA. We haven't seen a Major League Baseball deal done since I think it was the Mets deal back in 2020, give or take. So we'll see um, if one of those deals happens because it'd be interesting to see how a uh, baseball franchise might move up in value given the, the recent activity in other leagues. So what I'm trying to get my head around is, you know, you, you're trying to put value on, on like sports and it's kind of like a, an ego thing. You know, pe people want to own it because what it comes with. And you, get, you, you look at the big NFL, the Washington transaction of $6 billion. It's a huge number, right? But even like, like Major League Soccer, I mean, which you think is, is a small market, what's the value if I wanted to buy you know, a team? Like, what, would, what would it cost me? Yeah, the latest expansion fee, because the MLS, they're, they're growing the number of teams, and they seem to every couple of years bring in additional new entrants. So it was recently announced that San Diego will bring in the next franchise at an expansion fee of $500 million. So And that's, that's just a buy-in fee? That's just to get into the league. So that's a new record. I think the prior one was 350 ish which was a few years back. So what's driving that? Well, the, the growth of the league. Um, still, a number of MLS teams are probably not cash flow positive. So they're still building the revenues, building the overall cash flows. What we did see though is uh, recently, there was an a announced new media rights deal. I think it's about 200, and, 200 million a year, if I remember correctly. 
a step up from 90 million in the previous year. So we do see a pretty big increase there. And that was um, only with YouTube. That's without some of the other broadcasters and networks that will come in, um, such as Univision, Portis, and potentially others, which will drive that even higher. So I think it's just the overall, one, there's a lot of interest in soccer in general, just in terms of the fan base and continuing to grow that. Once you grow that and the networks, the broadcasters, the streamers get on board, see those media rights increases, which are driving those expansion fees. And then we're even seeing more established teams probably having values more at 750 million plus in large markets. And and I don't really hear about a single buyer coming in. It's usually a group because they're pooling their money because of the values are so high. Is that the trend? It depends on the league. There are some restrictions in terms of that ownership base and you need a majority owner or a primary owner that's going to come in, but then with limited partners that come in alongside of you and you need more limited partners as values continue to go up. Now the leagues have recently allowed private equity to come in and participate in minority interests of deals. So they're not the controlling interest owner, but they're buying either limited partner stakes or maybe putting in primary capital if teams need additional financing. Just about all of the leagues allow that now over the last three years it opened, except for the NFL. So we'll see if they start allowing private equity funds to come in in terms of minority investments. But effectively, the commander's deal um, is led by Josh Harris, who was a founder of a large fund. Six billion for that for Washington. San Diego pay, uh, pays a expansion fee of half a billion dollars. Right. right. These are huge sums of uh, money. I, NFL, I can see how big that market is, but Major League Soccer is growing, but it's not in the same scale as NFL. So it's the numbers are just mind boggling. Yeah. And, and it, it is interesting. And, and we would have said that when the Dodgers were sold a number of years back. Um, I was on a panel and someone asked me, what will the Dodgers sell for? The Cubs had sold a couple years before for 900 million, give or take. So I said, well, their media rights were coming up, local and national media rights. So I pegged it around 1.4 billion. They sold for 2 billion. So, and now yeah. if the Dodgers sold again, I don't know what the number would be, but it would be much higher than 2 billion. So again, back to capital appreciation, media rights driving not only value, but now driving profitability and cash flows, which kind of leads to the increased values that we're seeing across the sports landscape. So it sounds like if I wanted to get into into buy a team, I'd have to start off like maybe like a junior pick a ball team, you know, at a very <laughs> low level and work my way up. It'll given, be hard. Given, given that would probably cost me a few million dollars for that junior pick a ball team. Um, but I understand it's just the numbers are just going up and media rights are going up in terms of value and the, the ego thing is also driving, you know, more of a demand for, for these assets. And, and you have a lot of wealthy individuals that want to be part of the club. So sure. they, they make that investment. And from what you've seen historically, it's it's been profitable. Now the question is, will the media rights continue to move up that much? And will values continue to move up? Or will be, there be some sort of reset that slows that increase down to be seen. Um, I think different different people have different thoughts around that given the cash flows and just what's your real return over time. Yeah. Um, but a lot of these are also family owned assets that are held within the family for forever. And the only <laughs> reason I could see coming is that there's the, the pool of buyers is so small. It's just yeah, uh, I would say of, um, to, to, for the these assets. The buyer universe becomes more limited as values continue to increase. Got but it. I think for the limited partners, even if they own 5% of a team that's worth $5 billion, can they get that liquidity if they're looking to exit and sell? And I think that's why a number of these leagues have allowed the, the private equity and the funds to come in and make those investments. Got it. Now, Conrad, you were talking about uh, music. So is there a lot of common ground between valuing music libraries and that type types of assets and sports franchises? 
There are similar dynamics at play in in the sense that there's a scarcity of these assets. There's only a handful of top performing artists, kind of similar to the 130 or so professional sports teams. Um, on the other hand, we generally value these assets on discounted cash flow or income approach, whereas the sports teams, the uh, intrinsic value or the, the cash flows generated would never support multiples paid for these. Now, with some of the iconic and uh, more uh, famous acts and uh, seasoned acts, we are seeing multiples go up uh, pretty dramatically where you're seeing assets that yield probably less than 3% in this current interest rate environment. So there is a similar dynamic at play, but it, there is a little bit more of that annuity-like stream that we're able to garner from uh, from uh, music catalogs. Do you find that the buyers are pooling their money like we have in the sports side, or is more individual buyers? It, we've definitely seen a lot of activity with private equity. So over the recent years, you've seen uh, companies uh, pretty much designated to buy these music catalogs, such as Hypnosis. You've seen a lot of asset securitizations, a lot of uh, endowments, pension funds. Essentially, the allure of these assets is that they're uncorrelated with the market. Streaming uh, has pretty much, there's been statistics that show that streaming has been uncorrelated with uh, income and, you know, with uh, the rise in interest rates. It, it, it's a utility, music uh, it has become a utility-like feature, like where people don't want to give up music. They, they see that spending $10 a month for music is worthwhile and 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 you the the customer proposition is so great where you're you have access to millions upon millions of songs on demand whenever you want so it, it's it's a great asset and uh we definitely still see a lot of demand uh coming into the market for them during the years there are a lot of opportunities to buy music assets libraries things like that or is it kind of scarce it happens every now and then uh, over the last five to 10 years, kind of uh, corresponding with the rise in streaming since about 2015, when it really kind of catapulted, we have seen increased activity. Um, over recently, there has been a little bit of a slowdown just given the, the Fed's rise in interest rates. So we've seen buyers kind of hold back a little bit. Credit uh, standards have tightened up a little bit. So we see a lot of asset securitizations in this space due to the annuity like feature so we have seen uh it, it, we have seen activity start to slow down but we have seen uh robust activity especially in the upper echelons of uh the artist platform so you know those those artists that command a lion's share of streams yeah i think over the last couple of years i've seen some major artists sell their libraries, you know, and they're still living, you know, they're kind of cashing out. Yeah. It, it, what's kind of driving that? Because normally they, they, they're so protective of, of their creative process and their music. Now they're kind of selling it for a lot of money. Sure. And it, it, it helps to establish a little bit of context where the industry was decimated up uh, with that rise of online piracy. So essentially, the, from the peak in 99 down to 2015, the industry lost about 50% of its uh, total revenues in, re in the recorded music space. So now that you've seen streaming kind of rebound, you see multiples kind of increase. So a lot of artists have said, hey, I'm, I'm going to just uh, monetize this asset. Um, there was also tax considerations. Um, uh, prior to the previous or the current administration, there was talks of uh, changing some of the tax laws. So artists saw it as an opportune time with uh, it, the, the lower interest rate environment, uh, the demand for these assets, uh, additional buyers coming into the fold. Okay. So you've seen these assets uh, essentially become highly in demand um, and, and essentially uh, providing that uncorrelated stream. Got it. And Eva, you, you were speaking this afternoon regarding due diligence. Can you kind of talk about what that is as it relates to assets, music, or or sports? Yeah, so due diligence helps to um, uncover uh, the financials of a company that uh, you may hear from 
an interview or from reading a marketing document. It's really doing a deep dive, doing a fact-based analysis into the financials, understanding um, the quality of earnings, the maintainable earnings profile of the business, understanding um, the working capital requirements, any uh, cash flow or cash burn requirements, uh, any indebtedness. So it's, it's really a, a fact-based exercise um, to help you uncover issues that you may not know from uh, initial uh, meetings or, or interviews or reading a marketing document. Do you require like audited financial statements? Is that one of the, the key areas that you have that you use in your assessment or are you using a variety of things and maybe that's not critical? Yeah, we use a variety of sources. Um, the audited financial statements being a critical part, um, just having a independent third party, having done a deep dive into the financials is, is a key component. Um, we we uh, perform various procedures, including interviewing with uh, C-suite executive management to understand how they view the business, um, going through uh, tons of data, um, anything from going through financial statements uh, and, and going into a transaction level data, customer mm -hmm. data, product data, and really analyze the trends and, and understand, okay, how, how is this business making money? Um, how did they get to where they are today? So you're kind of testing the validity of the financial information, which can be used in the assessment, whether it be discounted cash flows or other things. You're looking at, are these numbers real? Are they accurate? Are they complete? Right? Because then you're going to use that, use that information and in all the things you do to value an asset. Correct. And um, some of those findings uh, for our clients, we find they will use as uh, inputs or uh, you know, uh, updates to the valuation model, which, you know, uh, Brian and Conrad might, might look at as well. So ultimately, um, from a multiples perspective, that may impact on the purchase price mm -hmm. uh, for a transaction. So, so, yeah. Great. Well, we covered the highlights of that session. Again, it was a fantastic session on valuing assets, whether it be filmed assets or music or sports. Uh, but. Thank you, Brian, Thank Conrad, you. and Eva. Thank you.